I want to welcome everyone back to part three of my reading of Crying Wolf, Hate Crime Hoaxes in America by Laird Wilcox. Just a reminder, Thomas and I are watching and reviewing movies. If you go to freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash movies, uh, there are links to where you can get them. The latest movie we did was, what was the latest movie we did? We did The Warriors, 1979. Before that, we did Mad Max, the original, Mel Gibson, 1979. So go check that out. All right, just going to jump in and start going. So we are up to chapter three about the prevalence of hoaxes and fabrications. How common are hate crime hoaxes? Civil rights, Jewish, and anti-racist groups stress the view that they are unusual and represent the misguided work of disturbed individuals. On the other end of the spectrum is the view held by genuine racists and anti-Semites that a massive conspiracy exists to commit hoaxes and publicize them as bona fide hate crimes. The truth, as might be expected, lies somewhere between these two extreme positions. The problem, however, has long been recognized even by anti-racist authors and journalists, although few of them have written about it. Ben Haas, author of the anti-Klan classic KKK, noted that, quote, it would be foolish, of course, to say that all violence attributed to the Klan was actually committed by Klansmen or as a Klan-sponsored activity. Therein lay the fallacy of the disguise. Any gang of hoodlums that could scare up the requisite robes and hoods could set out to have some sadistic fund or settle personal grudges, and the onus of their misbehavior would automatically fall on the Klan. In all likelihood, the actual extent of racist and anti-Semitic hoaxes can never be known as long as an uns as long as unsolved cases are uniformly regarded as actual and not merely suspected hate crimes. Police who investigate alleged hate crimes cases privately report that a surprising large percent are suspicious and likely hoaxes or pranks. In talking with college and university security officials, I encountered responses ranging from a few, not too many, to damn near all of them. Most officials were cautious and reluctant to talk without some assurance of anonymity, and several merely referred me to administrators who were even more paranoid. When a figure for hoaxes was ventured, however, it was often in the area of 20 to 30, 25 to 30 percent. This figure has a kind of reasonableness about it, allowing that it probably doesn't hold true for every environment. Deliberate misrepresentations, hoaxes, and frauds are surprisingly commonplace in American political life. They are more likely to occur in those issues where taboos, sensitivity, or fear of being called names are operational, or where the moral imperatives of noble social causes and crusades overwhelm individual judgment. Let's look at a few proven hoaxes involving blacks. In these examples, most people are deeply affected by the emotional impact of the message. Few ask whether the message is actually true. New heading, Roots, a search for black origins. As an example, perhaps one of the greatest literary hoaxes with strong racial overtones was committed by Alex Haley, author of the spurious book, Roots, which fraudulently purports to trace his ancestry back to a village in Africa. What is particularly troublesome about this hoax is that although knowledgeable researchers doubted Haley's work from the beginning, it wasn't until December 1978 when Haley settled a plagiarism lawsuit with Harold Corlander, author of the 1967 novel The African, for $650,000, that it became clear how seriously Haley had fudged his facts. In the meantime, the book had sold 1.5 million copies, and Alex Haley had won a Pulitzer Prize. Ironically, Haley was quoted on, 10, on April 10, 1977 in the New York Times, quote, it would be a scoop to beat all hell if Roots could be proved to be a hoax, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important to me to document as best I could. The Roots hoax had enormous consequences, for the story it fabricated was used to inspire militancy in a generation of Black people and was a significant factor in the development of Black political power in the post-civil rights movement, 1970s and 1980s. Its influence persists to this day. 
Although, <clears throat> although the hoax had widely had received widespread publicity, it's still widely regarded as an authentic and inspirational legend, not uncommonly shown in the nation's schools in order to sensitize white students to the black experience. The television miniseries it generated was viewed by an estimated 130 million people and broke existing Nielsen TV ratings. I remember watching that shit in my house. Ugh. My parents were half retarded most of the time when it came to bullshit like this. Subsequent research showed that Haley stole passages from other books and fabricated many of the characters. Even his pre-Civil War U.S. research, which some records were, where some records were, were available, was faked. When University of Alabama professor Gary Mills and his wife Elizabeth, editor of the National Geographic Social Society Quarterly, attempted to document Haley's genealogical work, they concluded, quote, The records show that Haley got everything wrong in his pre-Civil War lineage. 182 pages and 39 chapters on Haley's Virginia family have no basis in fact. So extensive was the hoax that Harvard professor Oscar Hanlon observed, quote, a fraud's a fraud. Historians are reluctant, cowardly, about calling attention to factual errors when the general theme is in the right direction. That goes for foreign policy, for race, and for this book. New heading. The Liberators, Black Jewish Reconciliation. A more recent example of a hoax involved fake black history is the 1992 public broadcasting system film, The Liberators, which purports to tell of the part played by the all-black 761st Tank Battalion in the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp in April 1945. Viewed by an audience of 3.7 million people, the film was nominated for an Academy Award. The film, lar largely the work of William Miles and Nina Rosenblum, producers of politically correct documentaries on blacks and women, was designed to ease strained black-Jewish relations. Leaders from black and Jewish communities viewed a special showing of the film and spoke of a common history of oppression. Good sentiments aside, they had chosen a fraudulent vehicle to bring the groups closer. E. Michael Jones talks about this all the time. And also, um, he points out that our current Secretary of State, um, what's his name, Benjamin Netanyahu's lawyer, Anthony Blinken, is he uses this saying that I think I believe he says his father-in-law was a part of this. He was when they came to liberate the concentration camp he was in. It was a tank and reached down a black hand to bring him up to. It, it was just total horseshit. Total horseshit. In a February 1992 interview in The New Republic, Rosenblum attacked critics of the film as Holocaust revisionists and attributed their criticism to racism. But according to former Army Captain David Williams of the 761st, the unit was nowhere near Dachau when the camp was liberated. He says, quote, on April 29, 1945, the 761st was near Straubing, which is about 70 miles from Dachau as the crow flies. Bridges were down, the tanks were all beat up. There wasn't enough gas. Nobody could have just taken a Sherman tank on a 140-mile round trip and not have been noticed missing. We would have been court-martialed. Philip Latimer, president of the 761st Veterans Group, said, all anybody had to do is look at our history. There's no mention of Dachau or Buchenwald. Other doubts about the documentary arose and articles questioning its veracity appeared elsewhere. Finally, in February 1993, WNET-TV, a PBS affiliate involved in the film's production, decided to withdraw the Liberators from circulation, admitting that the 761st Tank Battalion did not, in fact, liberate two concentration camps, as described in the film. This is just a real problem, you know? World War II was bad enough, was horrifying enough for everyone involved. You, if you want to tell the story of World War II and what you went through, what your people went through, what your family went through, just tell the story. You don't need to make shit up. New heading. Dr. Charles Drew, Death by Discrimination. One of the more enduring hoaxes has been the falsified account of the death of Dr. Charles Drew, 
a black physician credited with developing the blood bank system. According to the hoax, Dr. Drew bled to death following a 1955 automobile accident because a white-only hospital refused to treat him. This unfounded tale was repeated by National Urban League director Whitney Young in a 1964 syndicated column and black historian William Lauren Katz. That doesn't sound black at all. William Lauren Katz? wrote of the spurious incident in his 1971 book, Eyewitness, the Negro in American History. Katz has since acknowledged the error. Really? Admitted a mistake? I find that hard to believe. Dr. Charles Mason Quick, also a black physician, has said he wants to stamp out this perpetual lie about Dr. Drew. Quick... Quick says he personally saw three emergency room doctors work for two hours trying to save Dr. Drew's life. Drew's injuries included brain damage, and he died in the emergency room. Cecil Adams, author of the Straight Dope column in Washington, D.C.'s city paper, reported that Dr. John Ford, one of the passengers who was injured in Dr. Drew's car, reported that we all received the very best of care. The doctors started treating us immediately. Adams also mentioned a similar hoax involving a famous black blues singer. Quoting, the Drew story is strangely similar to one told about blues singer Bessie Smith. She, too, supposedly bled to death after an auto accident when a white hospital refused to admit her. The alleged accident, which occurred in Mississippi in 1937, was even the subject of a play by Edward Albee. Hmm. Just tell the same... You just go to the well, the same well, over and over again. And people aren't supposed to notice. And if you do notice, they call you a racist or an anti-Semite. New heading, Dr. Martin Luther King, A Case of Plagiarism. There has been no greater black icon than Martin Luther King, whose name became synonymous with the civil rights movement in America. Yet controversy plagued his life until his terrible assassination in 1968. It became widely known that he was abusive to women and frequented prostitutes as he traveled across the country. Several of his close associates had long ties to the Communist Party, what was what was known until long after what was not known until long after his death however was that his degree as doctor was unearned and in fact the product of fraud king's degree was awarded for a supposedly original thesis entitled a comparison of the conceptions of god and the thinking of paul tillich and henry nelson wireman he is submitted to Boston University in 1955 as part of his requirements for a PhD. Over the years, rumors built up about the originality of the work, and in 1990, the university established a committee to investigate the alleged plagiarism. In October 1991, the committee released its findings. There is no question but that Dr. King plagiarized in the dissertation by appropriating material from sources not explicitly credited in notes or mistakenly credited or credited generally and at some distance in the text from a close paraphrase or verbatim quotation. In spite of these highly damaging findings, however, the committee said that no thought should be given to the revocation of Dr. King's doctoral degree from Boston University. Committee members, through their spokesman, John Cartwright, MLK professor of social ethics, said, I think it is good to get this behind us. New heading, The Absence of Healthy Skepticism. Most Americans take a surprisingly uncritical and unquestioning attitude towards this problem, because if they question it, they get in trouble, they get called names and you know, lose your banking and you know all sorts of things. You're a bad person. They seem to believe that whatever is said or written or done in the service of a good cause must be truth, particularly if that cause is fighting racism and anti-Semitism. Why, after all, would anyone lie, fabricate, exaggerate, or distort when it seems clear that they are pure, in heart, pure of heart? And what if they did? Aren't they doing it for a good cause? And what are those who expose these deceptions? Isn't this evidence of some kind of covert racism or anti-Semitism? Why would anyone talk bad about a good cause? In short, those who lie and distort are the good guys, and those who pursue the facts of the matter are the bad guys. This is a pretty incredible situation indeed. For example, the elaborate rape hoax concocted by Tawana Brawley, her mother and Reverend Al Sharpton was accepted at face value by politicians in the media. 
It brought about a virtual orgy of white guilt and anti-racist agitation, and we were made to feel that in some metaphysical way, we were all somehow responsible for what happened to this young black girl. Finally, an intensive investigation revealed the hoax that should have been suspected early on. There are still people who believe that the story must have something to it. You even heard the argument that if it didn't happen to her, it might have happened to someone else somewhere sometime. It became a question of the identity of the victim and alleged victimizers, and not one of facts or evidence. For many people, that Tawana Brawley was black was all they needed to know. Nothing else carried as much significance as her minority status. New heading. Victimhood pays. In terms of cost-benefit analysis, the actual payoff for victimhood can be very high and the risk of discovery of a hoax is very small. The issue of secondary gain plays an important part in racist and anti-Semitic hoaxes and the search for an answer to this troubling phenomenon is well served by the question, who benefits? When a hoaxer gets caught, which, is, which isn't often, they are fallback, there are fallback positions which can put a positive spin on the incident. The hoaxer's status may be reframed so that blaming the victim can be invoked, whereby the hoax is understandable. Or he may become mentally ill, which also removes any responsibility for the hoax. Barry Dobschuss, jeez, what a pattern. Responsible for several apparently anti-Semitic arsons, wanted to keep awareness of anti-Semitism alive, and until he was caught, accomplished it through a series of arsons in Hartford's Jewish community. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into that story, but <laughs> Hartford, Jew Hart <laughs> Hartford Jewish community. The genesis of that and how that how that was established. Oh, oh. I'm planning on having somebody on who told me the story of that. Maybe we'll, um, maybe I'll bring that up. Psychi psychiatric treatment was the major part of his punishment. The rest was probation and a suspended sentence. In the case of Sabrina Collins, who fabricated harassment and death threats, the county prosecutor said she needed counseling and treatment, not prosecution for her hoax. I did not uncover a case where a white, non-minority defendant in a hate crime prosecution was treated so generously or re relieved of responsibility in such a manner. With hoaxes, the nature of the offense makes discovery difficult. Telephone harassment, for example, usually leaves no forensic evidence unless the problem is severe enough for police to order a monitoring device. Obviously, now that's almost, it's almost impossible. This happened in several of the hoaxes mentioned in this essay. A telephone message service by the Oklahoma White Man's Association was being sabotaged by endless incoming calls tying up the line. The group complained to the police and the telephone company who installed tracing uh, telephone company installed tracing equipment on the line. An investigation showed that the local Jewish community center, where a computer was apparently automatically dialing call after call, was the very source of the problem. In spite of hard evidence to the contrary, Jewish Community Center Director David Bernstein said, we have no computers here and we're not jamming any phones. No criminal charges were filed. In other cases, both Buzz Cody and Lori Recht, both of whom fabricated anti-Semitic death, death threats, were entrapped with telephone tracing equipment. In the case of defacing property with racist and anti-Semitic graffiti, investigation is made only slightly easier. Spray-painted graffiti, unlike handwritten or typewritten material, cannot be pinned down. In two cases mentioned in this study, the discovery of the very spray can in the possession of the victims led to their prosecution, but both were acquitted on the basis of insufficient evidence. They just saw it. It was, it was just laying on the ground, and they picked it up, and they just decided to walk with it. Just a spray can in their hand. I don't know that that was your argument, but that's, I guess, if I was a fucking moron and piece of shit lawyer, I, that's what I'd come up with. The eyewitness account is often an important factor in hoax investigation. In many cases, it was this that led authorities to suspect fabrication. The factor here was inconsistent testimony or different hoaxes by different witnesses, different stories by different witnesses, or physical evidence of lying. Where the possibility of hoax exists, the victim, the witness, who is often the victim, 
should be interrogated by a person skilled in that area. Surprisingly, the cover story often isn't very well prepared and can be cracked with reasonable effort. In the case of Quentin Banks, who faked a racist assault and death threats, it was a skilled interrogator who caught him in a number of contradictions and broke the case. New heading, Temptation to Fabricate Hoaxes is Strong. Because bona fide organized racist and anti-Semitic incidents are relatively unusual today, and because they serve valuable functions for the victims and their constituencies when they occur, the temptation to fabricate incidents is strong. Victims are usually treated as heroes who have been ennobled by their in experience and the rage against the suspected perpetrators, as well as representatives of their race, gender, gender or class, can be amazing. In terms of sheer effectiveness, nothing works quite as well as, as a racist or anti-Semitic incident to intimidate an institution, sensitize a population, polarize an issue, or silence critics. Victimization, genuine or fake, can, can accomplish more in minutes than months of organizing, agitation, and propaganda. The personal benefits are impressive as well. Many hoaxers have received substantial assistance from sympathizers and well-wishers, as in the case of Patricia Anderson and Lee Williams, who vandalized their own house and received offers of clothing, gifts, and money. Lori Recht, who faked death threats and graffiti, became a celebrity for her victimhood and wound up with a scholarship and an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters before her hoax was discovered. The most important benefits of victimization are psychological, however. The delicious sense of importance and meaning to one's life that victimization brings is often overlooked as a motive in hoaxes of the kind illustrated here. I suspect it plays a very significant role. The paranoid personality with its tendency to interpret everyday experience in vigilant and suspicious terms revels in the attention of recognized victimization. Victimization gives dignity to the undignified, importance to the unimportant, and a kind of I told you so self-fulfilling prophecy that explains failure and disappointment as few things can. Not being liked because becomes less of a question of what is wrong with you than what is wrong with others who don't like you. Oh, wow. I'm... <clears throat> Some people become important and valued for what they do, their contributions to their loved ones, to their careers, and to society, others for what is done to them. In the former case, many years of forming character traits and a reputation are required, and the resulting importance can be seen as a reward for recognized accomplishment. In the latter case, no such accomplishment is required, only that one is victimized. Victimization is instant fame, instant sympathy, and often in some form or another, instant compensation. Whatever shortcomings, unpopularity, or character flaws one has are eclipsed by the wickedness of one's alleged per persecutors. Having the right enemies can often lead to acquiring the right friends. In a, in a perspective article on victimization appearing in the New York Times Magazine a few years ago, Joseph Epstein discussed the issue of motivation quite perceptively. Quoting, Victimhood has not only its privileges, but its pleasures. To begin with, it allows one to save one's sympathy for that most sympathetic of characters, oneself. The pleasures of victimhood, including, including imbuing one's life with a sense of drama, the drama of daily life is greatly heightened if one feels a society is organized against one. To feel oneself excluded and set apart is no longer uh, obviously or even necessarily a bad thing. People who count and call themselves victims never blame themselves for their condition. They therefore have to find enemies. New heading, hate crimes harmful to bona fide racists, hate groups. There's a very important point that needs to be understood here. Bona fide racist and anti-Semitic harassment is invariably counterproductive for bona fide racists and anti-Semites. The quickness and skill with which racist and anti-Semitic incidents, including hoaxes, are used to galvanize anti-racist support in a community is amazing. No benefit accrues to racist and anti-Semites, and the costs are enormous. Not only does law enforcement immediately start targeting suspects for questioning, but efforts to entrap them in other offenses steps up as well. Who benefits? The honest answer is not white racist and anti-Semitic groups. 
so damaging to real anti-Semites and racists are desecrations and graffiti that one bona fide anti-Semite, Joseph Mlot Moroz of Salem, Massachusetts, was arrested for attempting to paint over anti-Semitic graffiti on a local synagogue. He claimed that the graffiti was intended to create a false impression of anti-Semitic harassment in the community. Malat Moros was charged with malicious destruction of property over $250 and civil rights violations, both felonies, according to newspaper reports. Although evidently a, not a hoax, a Lomita, California graffiti case demonstrates the counterproductiveness of racist and anti-Semitic vandalism and the skill with which these incidents can be exploited to generate sympathy and mobilize opposition to alleged perpetrators. In 1991, Janice Brett Elspus and her husband Shlomo found a Nazi swastika and the words white power spray painted on the garage doors of their house at 7.30 a.m. one morning. This was allegedly the ninth time their home had been the target of anti-Semitic attacks. A public relations professional, Miss Brett Elspus, immediately went into high gear and by 8.30 a.m. she was faxing a news release to area television and radio stations, quoting, by noon, we had finished several newspaper interviews and had posed for photos for each. Throughout the day, we did more interviews by phone and two major Los Angeles all-news radio stations and a variety of local, national, and international Jewish publications. And when five television crews showed up at 4 p.m., just one hour before the start of the Jewish Sabbath, we held an impromptu press conference in our living room. Within a week, the, New the Los Angeles Times had done three major stories, and the Daily Breeze, a Torrance Daily, published three major articles based in interviews with the couple. Numerous radio and TV stations had covered the incidents, and stories ran in several Jewish newspapers. The incident and resulting publicity were instrumental in rewriting a city ordinance dealing with hate crimes, and an ad hoc committee was formed to deal with graffiti and hate crimes. At the time of this writing, the case remains unsolved. All right. Chapter four. On the campus. The college and university campus, because of its young and imaginative population and also because of the immense pressure for political correctness, is a hotbed, hotbed of sensitivity and awareness of ethnicity and race. It is not surprising that a large number of hoaxes and pranks occur there, including some of the more imaginative cases. It's also on the campus that most of the unreported hoaxes occur, i.e. they are discovered to be hoaxes early enough that they simply are never reported in the campus or community press. Cases. Quentin E. Banks, a black student at Northwest Missouri University in Maryville, reported a racially motivated assault and death threats against himself to university officials in October 1988. Following extensive media attention, rumors of a Ku Klux Klavern among NMU students emerged and the campus shifted into a crisis atmosphere. Even the president of NMU, Dean Hubbard, bought the story saying, quote, we believe the clavern is made up of about five students who are distributing the leaflets and letters on the students' cars and under their doors. The U.S. Marshal's Office and the FBI have told us that this is a violation of the students' civil rights. We'll catch one of them these days at it. At a campus rally, some 200 students, faculty and administrators, protested that racism instigated by the Ku Klux Klan didn't belong on campus or in Maryville, and that it would not be tolerated. In fact, there was no clavern at N NMU, although as many as 15 black students had reported finding KKK flyers on windshields and dormitory doors. James A. Moran, Grand ja Dragon of a two-man KKK clavern in nearby Kansas City, took advantage of the publicity and announced, we'll grow and prosper off their paranoia with plans to, to exploit the situation. Newspaper accounts portrayed the campus as a hotbed of racism as the situation gained the national spotlight. The case unraveled a month later when the principal victim came clean and confessed to having fabricated the entire story. On the strength of the original complaint by Banks, 18, the university had summoned assistance from the FBI and a special unit of the Justice Department. Later, when President Hubbard began noticing inconsistencies in Banks' account of the alleged incident, he summoned a special investigator from the Missouri Highway Patrol. During the course of an interrogation by Sergeant Larry R. Stobbs of the patrol, Banks broke down and confessed to his hoax. 
During the several week period when Banks' story had been believed, he had been a campus hero, talked about and admired for his victimization. School officials encouraged Banks to address, address freshman classes on his alleged experiences. Uh, I found a flyer. According to Hubbard, the student became the center of much attention following the incidents. Banks was subsequently suspended for school for two years. He claims that all he did was devise a really big calculated plan to test university policy on non-discrimination. At the University of Kansas at Lawrence, students awoke one January 1992 morning to find flyers from a purported conservative Christian crusade posted throughout the campus. The flyer contained neo-Nazi icons, a border resembling a series of swastikas, a flaming sword, and three imperial eagles at the bottom. The content in the flyer was calculated to provoke the radical anti-racist and multicultural forces on the campus. It stated in part, aren't you tired of minority special interest groups being given preferential treatment on this campus? As the radical minority pressure groups indulge in historical revisionism, it is our duty to oppose the orgy of white male bashing threatening to destroy academic structure of our university. Join your brothers in on Friday, January 17th on Wesco Beach at noon to show the administration and the community of cultural extortionists the power of our voices. We must be heard. When the appointed date came, the area was filled with 200 anti-racist feminists, gay rights, and multicultural counter-demonstrators, all expressing their indig indignation over the message on the flyer. That couldn't have smelled good at all. Ugh. Led by Ann Wyke, chairman, chairwoman of the Lawrence Alliance and Dean of so Social Welfare Department at the university, the group was apparently disappointed that no one from the conservative Christian crusade had decided to appear. Nevertheless, a good conscious raising time was had by all, including speeches condemning racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on. In point of fact, there was no such group as the conservative Christian crusade. A hunt on and off campus failed to turn up a single member or even anyone who said they had heard of the organization prior to the flyers. The KU Department of Religious Studies was not familiar with the group. Campus police checked all local print shops and failed to find any who had printed the flyers. KU Police Lieutenant John Mullen said, as far as we know, there is no organization whatsoever by that name. He also th said the flyer was a hoax. The writer contacted the bona fide, uh, the few bona fide right-wing students on the campus, and none of them had heard of the group, although they acknowledged they would like to. <laughs> Quoting, Laird Wilcox, former KU student and founder of the Wilcox collection of contemporary political movements said that the flyer was obviously designed to stigmatize the ideas associated with and arouse anger and hatred toward them. The quasi swastika, the burning sword, and the imperial eagles are not particularly subtle attempts to evoke Nazi connotations, both on a conscious and subconscious basis, he said. The terms conservative and Christian as well as well, the reference to skin color and race, white male bashing, and brothers name the and brothers name the groups intended to be stigmatized. The reference of the academic structure of our university completes the suggestion of linkage between the interests of conservative Christians, white males, Nazi imagery, and the university administration and its policies. It's actually a cl rather clever creation. Wilcox also said that any thinking conservative Christian or white male activist would realize that the flyer would create a negative response would be entirely counterproductive. Ask yourself who actually benefited from this incident. It certainly wasn't any conservative Christians or white males who wound up being portrayed as Nazi sympathizers and racists. A year and a half later, the a year and a half after the incident, an ongoing investigation had failed to turn up any trace of the group conservative Christian crusade. Black students at Williams College in Massachusetts were horrified in February 1993 to find three racial slurs written on notebook paper posted on the door of the Black Student Union building. The event took place five days before the start of, the, of Black History Month. The campus convulsed with social consciousness, spasms, and indignant speeches condemning racism. 7.7% .7 of the students at Williams are Black. The notes posted on the Rice door had said, Die. And words go home and words 
and n words are worth less than dirt under this the dirt under this house wonder how much of this was really misspelled the black student union covered the campus with posters deploring the act and challenging students to examine themselves for racist attitudes shortly afterwards dean joan edwards informed the campus without specifying the student's race that a student had confessed to the act Although rumors spread on campus, it was a full 10 days before the Williams record, the campus newspaper, reported that Gilbert Moore, a black student, had been suspended. Interestingly, even though Moore had informed the Black Student Union of his acts when he confessed to university authorities, the BSU continued to exploit the incident as a bona fide case of white racism until the student newspaper reported otherwise. The newspaper had criticized the BSU for perpetrating an implicit lie through silence. In February 1993, Lewis Williams, a black sophomore and resident dormitory assistant at Slippery Rock University near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, returned to his room to find a racial epithet, head and word, scrawled on his door with a black marker. Two other black students, James Kenny and Daryl Carpenter, also found the word N on the door of the room they share in the same building. Williams reported the incidents. He opined that the slurs were related to Black History Month currently being observed on the campus. The incident reminded students of an off-campus prank cross-burning three years previously in which two white students were expelled and charged with ethnic intimidation and harassment. As might be expected, the campus was electrified. Williams, a member of the Black Action Society, was quoted in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette as saying, racism is not something you're born with, it's something you're taught. Students didn't have to wait long for the culprits to come clean. It was Williams himself who confessed to both incidents before campus police. Police filed criminal mischief, a summary offense, and ethnic intimidation charges a misdemeanor against Williams, none of which were likely to involve jail time. An attempted racist frame-up occurred at Ohio Dominion College in Columbus, Ohio, uh, December 1988, when white student Michael A. Smith, 22, found himself under arrest for sending threatening letters to 13 black students and faculty members. The threats were worded in the same way as was a section of a term paper on prejudice he had submitted to Janice D. Hamlet, a black teacher at the school. Hamlet had pointed out the similarities in the documents, which immediately implicated Smith. The letters stated, death to all ends and dumb Puerto Ricans. I can vouch for the second part. However, two Columbus police detectives who had taken a class from Hamlet took an interest in the case. Hamlet had been outraged by Smith's use of N in his term paper and had tried unsuccessfully to get him expelled. Forensic examination of the envelopes, the threatening letters had been ma mailed in, in turned up Hamlet's fingerprints and an examination of her typewriter determined that the letters had been written on it. In fact, she had copied part of Smith's essay and mailed it to the 13 blacks and then discovered that they were worded in the same manner. Ethnic intimidation charges against Smith were dropped and Hamlet was charged with two felony counts of ethnic intimidation and two misdemeanor accounts of aggravated menacing. The unequal treatment of Smith and Hamlet raised considerable controversy on the campus. Smith was immediately suspended without a hearing after being accused of sending the flyers, while university officials appointed a fact-finding committee to investigate the charges against Hamlet. Also, Smith was arrested at the school and hauled off in handcuffs in a patrol car, to a patrol car. One would think that such, that such a damaging fabrication would have ended Hamlet's career. At last report, however, she had returned to Kent State University to complete a PhD. Michael Smith subsequently filed suit against the university for $6 million and was awarded an undisclosed account in 1990. In Atlanta, Georgia, a black freshman at Emory University claimed she had been the victim of racist attacks in her school dorm in April 1990. She had discovered the phrases hang ends and die and die written under a rug in her closet as well as carved on her tampons in a drawer. <sighs> Sabrina Collins, 18, also claimed to have received two letters threatening to lynch her. In addition, bleach was poured on some of her clothes and stuffed animals and the phrase and hang was written on the wall of her closet. Bleach. Huh. Huh, Smollett. Huh, never mind. 
Despite an alarm that Despite an alarm that police installed in Collins' room, the incidents continued. Police eventually determined that a threatening letter had a grammatical error the victim commonly made, <laughs> that it was typed on the sort of typewriter found in her place of employment, and it had no fingerprints on it but hers. In the meantime, Collins was hospitalized and became mute. Two weeks later, she was re released after, after having recovered her speech. The incident triggered a march by 700 students in a sit-in in front of the administration demanding a crackdown on campus racism. Black leaders in Atlanta got into the act, perpetrating demands against hate crimes. Although it was speculated virtually from the start that Collins might be responsible for the events, considerations of sensitivity kept the lid on this aspect of the case for several months. Finally, police reports were leaked that confirmed suspicions. DeKalb County Prosecutor Ralph Bowen announced that he will not pursue charges against Collins. He said that Collins needs counseling and treatment, not prosecution. It almost seems like a script. The Collins case is interesting in a number of respects. Otis Smith of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP, perhaps without realizing it, admitted the utility of hoaxes in the following statement. Quote, it doesn't matter to me whether she did it or not because of all the pressure these black students are under at these predominantly white schools. If this will highlight it, if it will bring it to the attention of the public, I have no problem with that. According to Harvard Law School professor Alan Dershowitz, quoting, Ms. Collins first submitted her reports of racial harassment shortly after she was formally accused of cheating on a chemistry test. Hmm. Dershowitz noted that the ends justify the means when it comes to racism. Mentality will inevitably lead to false accusations being directed at innocent people. A widely publicized case of anti-Semitic graffiti bears special attention because of the manner in which it was handled, although the suspected perpetrator was eventually acquitted of the charges. Students at the State University of New York in Birmingham were shocked to find anti-Semitic slogans spray-painted inside the door of the Jewish Student Union office in November 1988. The slogans, Kill Circles and Zionazi Racists, were sprayed the day after the fifth anniversary of Kristallnacht, where Nazis terrorized Jews in 1938's Germany. Jeez. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Authorities investigate. And, and, and was it? Who actually did it? Never mind. Authorities investigating the incident soon zeroed in on a suspect. He was James Oppenheim, former president of the Jewish Student Union. According to the B'nai B'rith Hillel Foundation in Washington, Jewish students represent 50% of the school's enrollment, one of the highest ratios of any public university in the nation. SUNY Binghamton's president, Richard E. Dye, responded to the accusation with the statement that Oppenheim is entitled to full participation in all aspects of university life and that this should not be an occasion for prejudicing a person or a group. In September 1989, Oppenheim 20 was arrested by state police and charged with fourth-degree fourth criminal mischief and third-degree false reporting of a crime. These relatively minor misdemeanor offenses rarely result in jail time upon conviction. The manner in which the case was handled is a fascinating study. State police investigator Charles Gould, responsible for filing charges, said of Oppenheim, he's not a bad kid. The, Bingham, the Binghamton Press Sun Bulletin quoted police investigators as saying, quote, Oppenheim was trying to broaden recognition of anti-Semitism following a mediocre showing at a memorial to the victims of the Nazi Kristallnacht program. Student Association President Craig Spiegel read a statement that warned against judging Oppenheim before due process takes its course, its course at reminding students that anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression existed on our campus. Three weeks later, Oppenheim was selected to the Harpur College Council, the liberal arts college of SUNY Binghamton. Rabbi Arnold Fertig described Oppenheim as an emotionally high, highly committed young man devoted to Jewish causes on the campus. And we cancel our radicals. 
In addition to being portrayed as sincere if misguided, Oppenheim had another advantage. His father was an attorney and knew that the evidence against his son could be challenged. Aside from non-specified circumstantial evidence, the primary item was the very can of spray paint with John James Oppenheim's fingerprints found hidden in his desk at the Jewish Student Center. Not even a good criminal. This would seem incriminating enough, but the case was made that Oppenheim had just picked up the can and hid it so it wouldn't get lost. The judge accepted this account in December 1989. Oppenheim was acquitted of all charges. In all fairness, the decision for acquittal should be respected. At the time of this writing, no one else had been apprehended and there were no other suspects. The Dartmouth Review, a politically conservative student weekly newspaper, had been a thorn in the side of high-ranking administrators, some professors, and campus leftists, campus leftists at Dartmouth University in New Hampshire for 10 years. Its editors have been harassed and vilified for their values, opinions, and beliefs, and their more extreme critics have gone so far as to accuse them of racism and anti-Semitism. These critics had their fondest dreams fulfilled when a copy of the review appeared on the eve of Yom Kippur in October on October 3rd, 1990, with their usual credo, a quotation from former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, replaced with a quotation from no less than Adolf Hitler himself. Quote, I believe today that I am acting in the sense of the Almighty Creator. By warding off the Jews, I am fighting for the Lord's work. Interestingly, like many conservative campus publications, the review had been exceedingly strong in support of Israel against the Palestinians, but that brought them no protection from false charges of anti-Semitism. It will not. Do not, do not bend an inch, a centimeter to your enemies. Ever. The substitution was immediately recognized as sabotage. Review editors and staff quickly apologized, even taking out ads in the campus newspaper and began searching for the culprit. Amazingly, Dartmouth, Dartmouth University President James Friedman, along with numerous leftist student groups and off-campus activists, persisted in treating the quotation as if it was actually represented the policies of the paper and was, collectively, and was the collective responsibility of everyone who wrote for it. Appalling bigotry of this kind has no place at the college or in this country, Friedman said. Review editor-in-chief Kevin Pritchett, who is black and rather sensitive to racism, was not amused. Our knowledge is that it was an inside job by one or more staff members. Friedman's tirade against a review was so vituperative that former U.S. Treasury Secretary William E. Simon responded in an essay in the New York Times to the effect that, quote, Friedman led the campus in a nationally publicized rally against hate that quickly metamorphosized, metamorpho, metamorphosed into a instrument of hate, hate directed against student journalists who, as a result, suffered death warnings of threats of violence, as well as mean-spirited accusations. As a result of the Fuhrer and as a result of complaints about the review's editorial content from anti-racist groups, Barry Palmer, chairman of the New Hampshire New, of New Hampshire's Human Rights Commission, undertook a review of two year back two years back copies of the paper. Said Palmer, I read every single thing they wrote about teachers. I reviewed editorial, I reviewed editorials and editorial cartoons, and I didn't find any hints of bigotry or prejudice. After reviewing two years of the publication, I began wondering what all the fuss was about. Although no one was ever charged in the hoax, suspicion boiled down to a couple of staff members who have since left the paper. Pedro House Jr. of Cranford, New Jersey, was caught in the act of painting a series of racist and anti-Semitic slurs on a restroom wall inside a building on Union County College's Cranford campus in December 1989. House, who is black, is a postal employee in South Orange, New Jersey, and a part-time student at the college. Cranford Police Captain Harry Wilde said that offensive graffiti was found in the same restroom on eight different days within the past two months. The graffiti had become an issue around which anti-racist groups had rallied on the campus. Police also seized materials allegedly used to mark the drawings and epithets, which included swastikas and quotations about white power, Adolf Hitler, Jews, and blacks. House had been active in anti-racist movements. 
John Grace, a black freshman at Millbury College and at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont, had been at school less than a week in September 1983 before he got the first racist note taped to his window. The next day, he got a second note, which said, Die, N. Blacks on the campus rallied to his side. Erica Wanakot, dean of students, began her investigations and uncovered the horrible racist who had victimized Grace. She didn't have to look far. We conducted a vast handwriting check, and it was pretty clear it was his handwriting. He was confronted with it and admitted he had done, he had done it. In addition to the fake notes, Grace had also broken a window. The school, however, did not press charges. With Mrs. Wolcott said, he's obviously a young man with a lot of problems. You said a mouthful. Berkeley, California, police reported that there had been four attacks on white students by black students at Berkeley High School following the appearance of a racist leaflet on the campus in December 1991. The leaflet thanked, thanked blacks for killing one another in gang violence, among other things, and mimicked the stereotype of a white supremacist production. Two days later, police had located the flyer's author. He was black journalist Matthew Stelly, a reporter for the Black Weekly Milwaukee Courier. The leaflet claimed to originate from the KKK. Handed out to students at a Berkeley public transportation station, the leaflet brought an immediate, almost immediate reaction, according to Oakland Tribune reporter Robert Hollis. Quoting, that morning, seven or eight black teenagers who school officials said were angry over the leaflet attacked a number of white students, four of whom were injured. Police arrested one 15-year-old sophomore after he was identified by one of the students. Stelly is quoted as saying he wrote the flyer as a reverse psychology ploy to try and get the, these people, gang members, to stop this madness. Planned carefully, the risk of discovery of a racial hoax is minimal. However, even when a hoax is discovered, it may still serve its intended purpose. An example of this occurred at Pennsylvania State University at State College when an unidentified man placed six help wanted ads in the student newspaper asking for colored nannies. In January 1979, the expected and intended outrage resulted in several demands upon the administration. Quoting, about 75 students met with Provost Edward D. Eddy and demanded that the school increase the number of black students, professors, and programs to pro and provide more financial aid for blacks. The newspaper printed an apology in its Help Wanted columns, but editor David Skidmore said a second apology would not be run. He said the incident was being used to bring attention to a host of complaints by local black organizations. The six phony ads had been accepted by a junior staff member and were not approved by the newspaper's senior staff. The hoax was discovered after a search for the man who placed the ads. It was learned that the ads originally appeared in a South African newspaper and that they were placed in opposition to South Africa's racial policies. Two break-ins at Rockville, Maryland's Richard Montgomery High School resulted in incredible $650,000 in damages in February 1990. Included in this figure was damage to the library, computers, storage, and administration offices. In addition, gas jets were opened in the chemistry laboratory, filling the school with natural gas, threatening an explosion. According to news reports, the culprits, in an effort to implicate white supremacist skinheads drew swastikas on the walls and books and life-threatening anti-Semitic messages signed by Nazi youth. Investigators soon found those responsible when two students reported another student's account of the destruction. Arrested were Jason Wesley Knight, who is black, and Stephen Lawrence Bonner, 18, who is Jewish. Bonner reportedly said that Knight wanted to destroy the school and Knight's attorney, Myra P. Kovach, said Mr. Bonner took the lead. The incident, as intended, was originally reported as a hate crime. At Sir San Bernardino Valley College, a campus officer brought KKK flyers to work in order to make others aware that such literature was being circulated. The flyers were left on a table so other officers could familiarize themselves with them. However, when Arthur Johnson, 37, a black campus security officer, found one of the flyers in the campus mailbox in January 1992, he charged a fellow officers that placed it there as a form of harassment. Later, he confessed to placing the flyer in his mailbox himself. News reports noted that, quote, Johnson's accusations prompted an FBI investigation and sparked complaints about alleged racism. 
Reached at home by phone, Johnson declined to say much. I want to make all the right moves, said Johnson, a five-year veteran of the campus police force. Let me see what their hand is going to be. You know I'm no fool or nothing. You know I had a reason. Chancellor Stuart Bundy commented that the affair had been ta had taken a serious toll on the college. That department has been totally demoralized. The Board of Trustees has been charged as racist, he said. All right. So next time we get together, start on Chapter 5. And um, yeah, I hope you're getting something out of this. And I think at this point, if nothing, this is really just showing the genesis of where we are now. One of the things I'm looking at in this is that all of these people are claiming victim status when they're basically, many of them, like the girl at Emory, it's probably there as far as part of affirmative action. A lot of them probably don't even belong there. And they're playing the victim card when they're not a victim. Some of us, when we talk about the way, you know, Europeans, whites, Christians are being treated, we get accused of playing the victim card. Yet, you can watch the evening news, you can watch cable news, and they're openly declaring a war on the white population. They're saying they're doing it. I mean, imagine I know, imagine if the roles were reversed and pointing out hypocrisy or anything like that is just old at this point. But if that was white people on the TV, talking about how, you know, black people are no good and you know, their time has come. You, you, you can just imagine. But no, they're openly calling out whites, Europeans, Christians, white men, women, conservative women, women who want to stay home and have children. It's not, you're not playing the victim when you can present over and over again, you know, videos that have been compiled where they just show that white people need to be destroyed. This isn't victim. We just have to understand where we are, understand who we are. And figure out what needs to be done. There were ads during this. If you want to get the episodes early and ad free, freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash support. With Substack and Patreon, you get RSS feed, Gumroad. Um, if you support there, you can play the episodes right through, right through on the Gumroad platform. Uh, subscribe star, subscribe star, and through my website, uh, you'll get. The, I'll email the file to you. All right. That's it. See you next time for part four. Take care.